It's a good thing. Well, it's great to be with you again today. I just love it. I love coming over here. Uh, I, uh, when I'm driving from home, it takes me about 40, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. I, uh, just like Pastor Nathan mentioned, I come across that plateau and then drop down into Emmett, and it's beautiful. And uh, on a Sunday morning, it just kind of reminds me that this is the Lord's Day. And we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we have come into this, your house, to worship you and to bless your name. We are grateful that you are present with us today. And as we gather this morning, I ask that you bless us. Fill us with your presence in a mighty way. Open our hearts and ears to hear what you would say to us. And we ask this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus, the Savior, the Christ. Amen. <clears throat> My voice is kind of scratchy today. I'm not sure why. Yesterday, for um, about 25 years, we uh, the guest room downstairs in our basement was uh, the kids, grandkids. And so when we moved 26 years ago from uh, Seattle area where I pastored to teach at NNU, we bought this house. We had a, bought a five bedroom house because our daughter and her, her uh, six month old baby were with us. And so we made a nice little kids room down there. We had Noah's Ark uh, all over it, clouds, stars, the whole bit. And you know, that grandson is now 26 years old and he hasn't been in that bedroom for a long time and we still had bunk bed, we still had twin beds in there. And every once in a while we'd have guests come and they'd have to sleep in those twin beds. So we finally this week decided we're done with that. But you know, at 74, I'm not quite like I used to be at 34. And I've forgotten that painting a room, even one room, takes a little more energy than it ever used to. But uh, it's good. So it's no longer a kid's playroom. It is now actually a guest room. So if any of you need a place to stay, come on over. <clears throat> but it was a good week. My muscles are a little sore, but not bad. There was a letter written in kind of a childish scrawl, and it came to the post office addressed to God. A postal employee wasn't quite sure what to do with that, and so he opened it and he read these words. Dear God, my name is Jimmy. I am six years old. My father is dead, and my mother is having a hard time raising my sister and me. Would you please send us $500? Wow. Well, the postal employee was so touched. He showed this letter to his fellow workers, and they were able to raise $300. And they sent that to the family. A couple of weeks later, they received a second letter, again, addressed to God. And the boy thanked God, but he ended with this request. Next time, would you hand deliver the money directly to our home? If you send it through the post office, they deduct $200. Now, that's pretty good faith, don't you think? Today, I'm going to talk to you about another young man who had similar childlike faith. Now, for the last several weeks, we've been in a series. You may not have known it, but maybe you may have connected the dots. The series is Heroes and Heroines of the Bible. We've shared stories of Zacchaeus and Esther, 
Isaiah, the prodigal son, Ruth, and Stephen. Well, today's biblical story is about a young man with the same kind of childish faith Jimmy had. And the setting is found in 1 Samuel 17. Israel is at war with the Philistines. Now, this is not a new story. If you read the book of Judges, you remember that Samson really terrorized the Philistines and they gave back as good, I suppose, as, as they got. But in today's story, the strong man, different from Samson, the strong man in that story, the strong man is on the side of the Philistines. His name was Goliath, a giant of a man standing over nine feet tall and wearing a suit of armor weighing 240 pounds. Bible, lands are, Bible lines are drawn. The Israelites are on one hill, the Philistines on a, another. There's a shadow valley between them. Goliath would march down every day and yell, who will go fight me? Let us decide the fate of our two nations in one-on-one -on -one combat. <coughs> he hurled that challenge to Israel for over 40 days. The entire army was demoralized. And they were totally immobilized. No one in Israel was willing to fight the giant. While all of this posturing by the Philistines was going on, Jesse, a local sheep farmer, sent his youngest son David to see how his older sons were doing on the battle lines. When David arrived at the Israelite camp, he heard the murmurings, and yet he sensed this fear. Everyone asked him this simple question. Have you seen the giant? <laughs> well, how could he miss this giant coming down in the midst of the valley and yelling? I mean, who couldn't see and hear that giant? Now, the king, Saul, was offering extravagant gifts to the one who would succeed in beating the giant. A little aside here, that kind of reminds me of a story. There was a man in Texas, you know, everything's big in Texas, and he was throwing a huge party. He told all those present that if anyone would jump into the swimming pool, which he had filled with alligators, ferocious alligators, and would swim across, he would have the choice of three gifts. One million dollars, 1,000 acres of prime Texas ranch land, or the hand of his daughter in marriage. Shortly after he finished, he heard a splash and saw a man just furiously swimming across the pool. After the man had climbed out, the rancher ran over to him and said, well done, son. Now, what do you want? One million dollars? No, sir. 1,000 acres of prime Texas ranch land? No, sir. Oh, well then, the hand of my daughter in marriage? No, sir. I just want the name of the fellow who pushed me in the pool. <laughs> Saul was offering extravagant gifts, huge gifts for anybody willing to fight the giant. You see, life can be about perspective. As the Israelites were camped on their side of the valley, the chief question in the Israelite mind was, have you seen the giant? That's a perspective of fear and defeat. But when David arrived in camp, he brought a new perspective. You see, he never referred to Goliath as the giant. He referred to him as that uncircumcised 
Philistine. To him, Goliath was a Philistine who happened to be a giant. David said, I'll go. I'll take care of this Philistine. He couldn't understand why the Israelites would allow Goliath to challenge them. After all, they were the army of the almighty God. At first, the soldiers just laughed at him. This little 16-year-old boy. I mean, come on. It seemed absurd that David could fight the giant. But when they really realized that David was serious, they tried to get him ready by putting Saul's armor on him. That wouldn't do. You see, David wasn't comfortable. He could barely move in that heavy armor. He needed to fight the way that he had when he had killed the wolf, the bear, and the lion. He needed only the protection of God. So David takes his staff, picks up five smooth stones from the creek, grabs his sling, and marches out to meet Goliath. Now Goliath, he laughs the hearty laugh of the overconfident. He says, who are you sending me? Children, go back home, sonny, and play with your toys. Leave the real fighting to me. But in spite of the taunts, David kept coming. David retorts, I come in the name of the God of Israel, and God will give me victory over you and I will slay you, and we will have victory over all of you. Well, Goliath, he moves in for the kill. David runs to meet him. He puts a stone in his sling, and he lets it fly. It finds its mark in the forehead of the giant. Goliath falls face down on the ground. The Philistines scatter and Israel wins. See, David defeats Goliath and he does so not with the weapons of war with which Saul sought to equip him, a sword, a helmet, and a coat of mail. No, no. He conquers with the instruments that he used as a shepherd. A sling, a stone, and most importantly, the name of an almighty God. So what's the story teach us? I think it teaches us a lot. It's more than just simply a story we love to tell our children. It's an important story, and there's some things I think we need to learn. First of all, I mentioned it already, but we often need a new perspective. You see, we probably face giants in our lives, and sometimes all we can see is, have you seen the giant? Have you seen this thing, this giant in my life? You see, when David got to the camp, all the people could talk about was the giant. All they could focus on was the giant. So how did David do it? He conquered because he had a new perspective. He understood who God was. And he understood that God was able and willing to bring victory. You see, God has power over giants, whatever they are. God has power over giants. God can triumph in the face of overwhelming odds because he is the Lord of hosts, the God who is over all. We sang some amazing songs in our, in our singing time about that very truth, about how God's foundation is one that we can trust. 
Sometimes when facing our giants, we need a new perspective. I think it's easy to get caught up in the rhetoric of our culture or the pressures of life. We need a new perspective. So how do we get one? Well, I think we first of all need to assess the situation clearly in light of the power of God who is willing to help us. And then we need to name it. We need to name it. Name the giant. You see, with God's help, we need to overcome our fears. Once we name it, like David did, it's not a giant. It's just an uncircumcised Philistine. A man. You see, it's difficult to face forces that seem greater than we are. And often those forces sometimes strike fear in our hearts. That's the situation of Israel as they stood on their mountain. The Israelites, when they saw Goliath, felt overwhelmed and unable to help themselves. It's easy to fear what you don't know. It's easy to fear when you're not sure what to do. It's easy to fear when it feels like things are out of control. That's the time to name it. Call it what it is and get a new perspective. I met a student of mine once who was soon to graduate. He had no idea what he would do. You see, he had majored in elementary education, planning to be an elementary teacher. And the reason he'd majored in elementary ed was he was really good with children. However, after doing his t student teaching, you have to remember, this is four years. He's been in college now, and he's doing his student teaching. It became clear to him that he didn't have the overall commitment or wherewithal to do lesson plans and teach every day. He simply wanted to help children. As we sat there and talked, it became evident that he was full of fear. You see, he had a wife and a nine-month-old baby. He was about to graduate in a week, and he had no idea what was coming, and he feared the future. It was my privilege to lead him back to God no, he was a Christian. I wasn't leading him back to God for that. I was leading him back to God so he could really see who God is and was and could be in his life. That God could bring calm in the midst of that storm of fear. We discussed what he was passionate about and what he loved to do. And after talking, oh, maybe for three quarters of an hour, hour maybe, he discovered a new dream. It wasn't something I told him. I just kind of asked him, what do you think? What are you passionate about? Where's your love? And all of a sudden, it began to dawn on him. Now, it meant he's going to have to maybe do one or two more years of college to prepare for the job that he really knew he needed to do. But you know what? That didn't scare him. The fear had gone because he was convinced that he was on the right path. He knew that God could take care of his fear and he knew that he had a new direction that was filled with hope and expectation because he knew God had him. God was with him. David knew from where his strength came he knew who was leading. He knew who could help him. In Psalm 27, he writes these words. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? Often the temptation is to look at the problem instead of the one who can provide a solution. Oh, I know it's not an easy thing. 
In Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a slogan which says, let go and let God. It is marvelously liberating to let go and let God. To trust God and decide to act in his will instead of worrying is a challenge, but it's so necessary if in fact we are to keep giants from defeating us. We must face our giants. Have you seen your giant? Well, I'm here to tell you, you need not fear. God can help you face that giant. I don't know what your future is. I don't know what your fear is. But I'm here to tell you. And I know it's hard to hear because it seems simplistic. But you can gain a new perspective. You can recognize for what it is. Call the giant by name. Realize that only God can help. Bring the giant down to eye level. When David called Goliath an uncircumcised Philistine, he affirmed that Goliath was just a man. He was a man that God could help him defeat. Bring your giant down to a level where it no longer dominates you. He'll still be hanging around. Goliath was hanging around until God and David fixed it. Without God, you can't do it. You really can't. But with God, you can. You see, God's job is putting pieces together. And you know what? God loves his job. When I was pastoring the, the, the Grand Church of the Nazarene, there was a young lady in the congregation in a wheelchair. She was uh, 25, 26 years old, had been living with her parents for some time. And she had no plans for the future. Her wheelchair and her condition created a giant that seemed impossible for her to overcome. I started talking with her. I shared the story of David and Goliath. She developed out of that conversation, those conversations, a new attitude. She has since gone back to college is now an elementary school teacher. She's still in a wheelchair, but you know what? She told me not long ago, she looks at that wheelchair, and for her, it's her avenue of ministry, not a giant anymore. She, with God's help, conquered her giant. The story I've told you today of David and Goliath is it's more than just a story from long ago. It's a story that asks, I believe, a simple question. What giants do you have in your life? What dominates your fears? What is demobilizing you and keeping you from fully embracing and celebrating life? I don't know what your giants are, but I know one thing. You can get a new perspective. Now, you can try to hide. You can deny they exist. You could even run away from them for a while, but they won't go away. How do you intend to deal with them, those giants? See, I don't know what giants you face. I know one thing. You must rely on the power of God to help you face and conquer them. You see, giants are not really as big or uncon unconquerable as we think. Next to the sufficiency of Christ, they are small. Name your giant for what it is and rest in the reality of God's strength to get you through. How about it? I think today is a good day to see that giant for what it is to call it by name, to give that giant to God. I think it's a good day to begin to see victory with God's help. His promise is sure. He says these words in Isaiah, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. 
I've called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I haven't come this morning to share this story with you uh, to offer any Pollyanna kind of solution or to see only through rose-colored glasses. I've had my giants too that I've had to face. And there was a time when they seemed almost unbearable. But you know what? I discovered simply by naming them, God helped me have victory. You see, I know we face many things that can overpower, seems like, and even potentially overcome us. Issues, circumstances in life can seem overwhelming. But I declare that there is one who's able to walk with you through the journey and help you with your giants. I'm here to tell you, you can depend on God, really. Again, that's not some Pollyanna thing. That's true. Some of you that have little white hair on your head like me, you could probably testify to that how that you've had to face some giants in your life and God has brought you through. Don't be afraid to tell those stories because they can be an encouragement to those who need to face their giants. You can depend on God for strength, courage, and support, no matter what. And to use an old cliche, you can take that to the bank. We're going to sing an old song. I mean, uh, at least it was for me growing up. I sang it. We sang it often. It's a great old song, but talks about what I've been talking about. And it's how do we have victory in Jesus? You'll see the words on the screen. me 
with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Father, our faith in your power and your providence is strengthened today by our reflection upon the experience of David and his encounter with the giant Goliath. You remind us through this story that there is nothing in all creation that is more powerful than you. By your strength, David defeated Goliath. And by it, we too are sustained from day to day and minute to minute. Help us, O oh God, to cling to your living word, Jesus, to root ourselves deeply in him so that we may be a people who face with confidence the trials and tribulations that come. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, if you listened well today, you were reminded that there are no obstacles too great, no giant too big, that God cannot bring them down to eye level. God can help you to overcome whatever it is you face. That's the key, I think. God will help you in the midst of all you're going through. I can guarantee it. Reflect on the promises of God and realize that God is always with us that he calls us to live into the kingdom of grace, love, and life. May we learn, lean heavily into the promises of God. May we be a people of hope who fully trust in God. And that's why this benediction is for us. Now, may the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be power and glory forever and ever. And all the people say, amen. Go in peace. God bless you.